Hello everyone and good evening. Uh, if you're a first time participant, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'd also like to welcome back any returning participants and uh, we're excited to start up the virtual grand rounds again this year. Um, before I introduce myself, I'd like to bring your attention to the poll that should be on your screen. It's ask which professional role do you represent? Um, and if you could just click on whatever response best applies to you. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to, to tonight's virtual grand rounds presented by the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. My name is Michael Tarr. I'm a third year medical student at New York Medical College, and I'm the AADMD virtual grand rounds facilitator. All right, so let's see. I'm going to close the poll. And as you can see, we have 17% of our participants um, work in administration, 17% are students, 17% uh, work in medicine, and 50% said other. So I'm going to hide that. And as I keep talking, I'm just going to ask you to answer our next poll. It says, in which stage of your career are you? So the purpose of the virtual grand rounds is uh, they, they seek to create a space for mentorship and exchange of knowledge and experience between seasoned IDD providers, entry-level clinicians, and future healthcare providers in training. The purpose of the Grand Round sessions is to expand and strengthen the IDD healthcare workforce across a spectrum of experience levels. All right, let's see, I'll give a few more seconds. Um, while I have your attention, I'd like to, you all to look down at your control panel. There's a handouts uh, tab, and if you click on that, you can download the PowerPoint for tonight's presentation, so you can follow along if you'd like. So I'm going to close the poll and share it. So. When we asked which stage of your career are you in, said 7% said a pre-health profession training, 14% said health professional training, and 79% said currently practicing. All right, we just have one more poll. So at the end of the session, um, you're going to find a link to a quick survey that we've made in the chat box. Um, it shouldn't take more than five seconds, five minutes, but it's very important for us that you fill it out because the feedback we receive through this survey allows us to improve the virtual Grand Rounds experience and also to hear what future presentations you'd like to hear. Um, so let's close this poll. All right. And share. This just said, what do you hope to gain from this webinar? We said 8% said they'd like to learn foundational healthcare concepts for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. 54% said gain interprofessional perspectives on healthcare for IDD individuals. And 38% said gain pearls from complex and challenging clinical cases. So if you'd like to view our previous virtual grand round presentations with accompanying lecture slides, um, we are in the process of working to upload our past presentations onto the AADMD website. So once we get those up, anyone who has registered for any of the virtual grand rounds in the past and present will receive an email telling them how to access these videos. So. Finally, I would like to introduce tonight's presenter, Dr. Susan Danberg. Dr. Danberg is a behavioral optometrist in private practice. She specializes in visual therapy and rehabilitation. She's board certified in vision therapy and follows and a fellow of the College of Optometrists in Vision Development. She is a certified practitioner in neurolinguistic programming and Ericksonian hypnosis and is the only optometrist in the U.S. to have developed and integrated techniques to this. She plays a pivotal role in training eye care practitioners on how to examine and treat persons with intellectual disabilities. 
and she is currently working with children and adults with learning disabilities, developmental delays, and traumatic brain injury using both NLP and VT. So um, with that being said, I'd like to hand the floor off to Dr. Damberg. Thanks, Mike. Good, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining. Um, as you could see, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, my particular specialty, which is behavioral optometry, and our, and our unique perspective on treating um, the ID, LD, and ND populations, and how we view vision and um, vision and learning. So one of the first things that I want to talk about is the definition of vision. Most people use the terms vision and sight uh, synonymous, synonymously. Um, sight refers actually to um, the clarity of an image that's produced um, going through the visual, uh, going through the visual organ of the eye and uh, the retina and onto the brain. Whereas vision is something much more comprehensive. It it is the act of taking what is seen through sight through the organ, interpreting it and then um, in turn acting upon it as, um, as what might be appropriate or and sometimes inappropriately. So when they say vision is the window to the brain, um, it's not only literal, it's figurative, it's also literal as you'll see as, uh, in some of the uh, 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 images I'll show you about, about the anatomy. Um, so again, sight is the ability to respond to light, something like a camera. Um, and it is the function of the sense organ, in this case the eye. And vision is the ability to identify, interpret, and understand what's being seen. And therefore, that's, um, that takes into account a lot of perceptual um, information and, and perceptual behavior. And it is the function, uh, and vision is the function of the eyes, the brain, and the body. It's not just the function of the eyes alone. And that's where behavioral optometry is, comes in that's different than mainstream optometry or mainstream ophthalmology. Because um, it, it's a question that's always asked, especially um, by people who, who may not be in the medical field. There is, there, people are often confused about the terms, so I'm just going to uh, define them for those of you who may not be that familiar with um, optometry, ophthalmology, and optometry and opticians. An optician is a technical person who actually fabricates and makes glasses. Um, an ophthalmologist is a medical doctor whose um, studies are really um, um, uh, mostly about medical conditions and the treatment of medical, medical uh, conditions and surgical conditions. Whereas optometry is somewhere in between and be depending on what what state and what country we practice in, um, optometrists are allowed to treat many um, uh, many common diseases such as glaucoma. In some states and in some places, uh, they're able to do lasers, and in some places, they're not able to do many of these things. So again, our our we're sort of the bridge. Um, we're often the the bridge um, profession between um, optometry and, and uh, between ophthalmology and opticianry. So I put this in here at the last minute. It is not in the handouts. And the reason why, because I wasn't sure what the uh, composition of our group would be tonight and how many of you were that familiar with um, ocular anatomy and, or how many of you have forgotten your <laughs> ocular anatomy. So I just put it in there just, and just so we'll go over it very, very quickly. Um, there's a cross section right here of the eye, and you can see some of the um, some of the uh, um, parts of the eye that are labeled, such as the pupil, which is the for those of you who don't know, um, which is the opening between. Um, uh, if you look at somebody's eyes, that it's the dark hole in the middle there. It's actually an opening. Um, the cornea is the uh, front shell of the eye. It's actually acts like a refracting lens. Behind the pupil is a, uh, an organ called the lens, which is another um, a part of the visual system that will actually take light and bend it in order to focus it. And then there's the iris, obviously, the colored part of your eye, and so on. And so, in, and then moving towards the back, we have um, the retina, which is the photosensitive 
organ uh, lining the back of the eye, the fovea, which is the area of uh, central vision where um, most critical detail could be seen, and then, of course, leading from, uh, from the retina and the retinal cells and so on uh, are the nerve pathways through the optic nerve. Um, um, the eye is filled with a gel called the vitreous. Um, those of you who are old enough uh, may, uh, may have floaters and things like that. That occurs in, within the vitreous and between the, um, the iris and the cornea is another uh, liquid called the aqueous. And again, this is, I'm sure many of you know this, but I just figured it was important for, for the few that may not uh, know this or, or may have forgotten it. Um, what I wanted to show you here, though, was how complex vision becomes, because that, in, that visual information that comes through the sense organ um, as light com passes through uh, the cornea, the, uh, the lens, back to the retina, and, um, and energizes those areas. You can see how it's depicted on this, on, this, um, on this picture, how many areas that information goes to. And this is just the pathway forward back to the visual cortex. And you can see that it, it goes through the thalamus, some of these um, some of these pathways will be end up being very very complex, and, and this is the area that we're going to talk about later. So you can see it goes from the eye, eye to the thalamus to the primary visual cortex, and it's broken up into into several streams. We call this the dorsal stream and the ventral stream, um, and it it affects um, our ability to move in our perception of movement, our perception of, of space, where we're located in space, where other things are located in space, how we orientate, orientate ourselves, and, um, and the perception of where, uh, where other things are. And it, there's also two main identifiers or two main systems of the what is it and the where is it system. And sometimes, uh, for those of you who might hear this, it might be called peripheral and central um, streams. It may be called parvocellular or magnocellular. But what we have here is we have several different pathways that break up that, that, that simple light um, 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 input into very, very complex um, um, information that goes in, that goes to many many parts of the brain. Okay. okay, so we have um, the dorsal stream, and you can see it goes from the midbrain to the parietal and superior temporal cortex. Um, it helps us organize space and motion. It regulates what are called saccadic eye movements. Those are sort of uh, ballistic movements from point to point. It helps us regulate our head movement in response to a visual, um, uh, visual stimuli. Um, it allows us to make sense of other, of other information that's coming in, whether it's vestibular, whether it's proprioceptive, um, whether it's auditory. And um, it allows us to understand um, whether whether what we're viewing is in motion, or whether we ourselves are in motion, or whether we're both moving. And then we have what's called the ventral stream. This, um, this information comes mainly from that foveal area, so that's the area of, of um, uh, detail. So it's the kind of the what is it. It's like, you know, it, um, it tells us, uh, it helps us identify what something is. It, um, it gives us recognition. It relies on you know, past experience in order to, in order to give some uh, immediate recognition from something that, that was, that's been known before. And it associates with some long-term um, stored representations. And again, it's all about where we are or, or from our perspective rather than from, um, from object perspective. So the main reason I put all this in is because I want you just to get an appreciation for how complex a vision actually is. Sight, eh, it's kind of complex, but 
but you know, it could be you could be nearsighted, you could be farsighted, you can have a little bit of astigmatism. But vision is very complex, and it really encompasses many, many of our, um, or the base of many of our behaviors. So, with that, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit about why people don't get eye care. Um, first of all, there's there's the um, understanding of the need, and this would be from let's say um, the family or the uh, or the parents, whether they understand that their child does have a visual problem, because um, mostly children and people with intellectual disability are very poor reporters of what is happening to them, even if it's something change, even if it's something new. So they don't often report that um, that they see that things are not clear, that things are double, that um, you know that they're dizzy. So there are many, many things that they don't they don't um, uh, make known to either their caregiver or their family. Um, the other issue, the other big issue, is access to appropriate care. Um, we all know, for on this call, we all know that not everybody knows how to deal with patients with intellectual disability. Um, many of them may may have, you know, preconceived notions or prejudices of their own about the need for for health intervention, whether that's uh, whether that's vision or dental or so on. And then also health literacy issues, whether the you know whether the people who themselves have uh, or the families themselves understand the issues and their significances. So, um, as a behavioral optometrist, um, again we're looking for uh, proper visual development in, their pa in our patients, um, and that development starts at birth. And later on, I'm going to talk a little bit about how vision vision develops uh, uh, for the, from the first year of life and so on. And we're looking specifically at uh, what we call visual skills. And these skills can include uh, focusing, how sharply we can, uh, we can bring something into focus um, and, and enhance, identify what it is, how we can move our eyes smoothly or ballistically from point to point, binocularity, how we use the two eyes together. Um, we're, um, we do a lot of treatment of conditions called amblyopia, or some people can know it as lazy eye, where one, one or both eyes are not correctable by standard means to 2020. Uh, to um, uh, conditions such as convergence insufficiency, which, is, um, which describe a, a condition where the two eyes don't um, necessarily line up together at the right place and, and, and the right time. Um, and these are things that behavioral optometrists take great, great care to remediate through, um, through specialized uh, prescriptions, including prism lenses, and or uh, what we call visual therapy. And later we'll talk about that. Um, very few people actually are, become behavioral optometrists. It's very time consuming, um, not only to become a, a behavioral optometrist and become board certified, but also to, um, to take the time to listen to your patients. So um, it is not one of these exams where you delegate you know, a half to two thirds of it to a technician and then the doctor comes in and does a few, um, a few tests and says, okay, well you have this and that. It's really um, from, you know, from the moment the patient walks in the door to the moment the patient walks out the door, we are analyzing um, how vision and um, visual skills impact that patient's life. And as, a, as, a, as, a, as designated and as Michael said in, in the introduction, I am a fellow of the College of Optometrists and Vision Development, which is the board certifying body. And again, it takes um, uh, a long time to pass, these, um, uh, to pass the, um, the testing in order to become board certified. And um, these are the these are the colleagues uh, worldwide who, who are most, probably most um, educated in how to treat this population. Um, so the next major question that I'll, I'll hear from people is, well, my child has 20-20 vision. That's usually determined by either a school exam or from the pediatrician, perhaps. And why should they have, um, you know, should they have an, a, another exam? and, and is, could there still be a, uh, a possibility of a visual problem? And the, here's where the big definition of between sight and vision comes in. 
2020 is a site measurement. It only tells you about the clarity of the image. It tells you nothing else about how the image is processed through the brain. So it's very, uh, it's, it's, um, it's not unusual, especially within this population, for somebody who might have 2020 vision to still have difficulties. Further, 2020 vision typically is a, um, especially in schools, um, um, it's usually only a distance vision, and it does not tell us anything about uh, what's happening at uh, near range, where most learning is taking place, especially in schools, uh, the schools, and and in the workplace environment. Um, many of our patients, many of the ID population now works. They might work um, in a um, uh, sorting and uh, doing some kind of computer work and so on. So 20-20 vision at distance does not predict, nor does it um, explain how the visual system is still working. Um, so people with 20-20 um, uh, vision can still have some sensory motor deficits. Uh, they could still have difficulties with eye alignment, eye teaming, um, uh, visual fatigue. So many times these might be missed in a conventional exam, especially as a conventional school exam. Um, so as optometrists, as behavioral optometrists, and again, many of us see the IDND and DD population, we're looking at sensory deficits. We um, we want to know how that might um, impact cognitive understanding, um, how it might affect behavior, and how it might um, affect um, physical involvement and how physical involvement might affect vision. So one of the things that uh, behavioral optometrists believe is that 70, at least 75% of all uh, learning is visual. Um, and so if you look at these two pictures, you can very much see um, there's a lot going on visually, even in the even uh, into the pictures on the left with the young children. The, there's a lot of a uh, lot of things to see. There's a lot of visual clutter, if you will, to somebody who has difficulty sorting that. Um, things are being presented to them visually in, in the forms of books, and then and, and then in the modern classroom uh, uh, on the right with the older children, you can see that they're all using some kind of laptops. Um, and that's going to be probably the standard uh, moving forward, at least in this country. And so um, about 20% of all school children may have some kind of visually related learning problems. And up to 70% of children with learning disabilities and ID and ND um, may also have some kind of significant visual component to their learning problems. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about visual development um, just so um, you get an appreciation for how, um, how, how the infant's development actually impacts vision and vice versa. So visual skills um, are developed. We're not born with visual skills. We're not born with the skills of, of binocularity. We're not born with the skills of um, accommodation or focus. We're not born with the skills of eye tracking movements. These are all learned or acquired skills. And there can be many reasons why someone does not learn or acquire these skills fully or accurately. Um, and as, a, as it says there, this, these stages of building these skills have to be completed sequentially. If they're not, then we can, uh, we can probably predict or find later on in life um, visual problems that might turn themselves up um, in, in the school situ in the schoolroom uh, situation. So again, diagnosis is key here. We want to know whether we have a visual development problem, and um, and then we know how, then we can go on to discuss treatment modalities with the patient and the and the parents. Um, so, so visual input starts with random looking. Uh, if you think you know, those of you who have, who have had children or 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 see infants regularly, you know that everything is fairly ra random with, uh, with, a, with a very young infant. Movement is random, um, uh, visual scanning is random, the fovea, the area of the, uh, of the, of the retina that um, is concerned with um, um, 
the smallest detail actually does not mature until six months old. So in those first six months of life, a lot of uh, life, a lot of things are sort of random and or dependent on the motor system. And this is where we're going to talk about how the visual motor, what we call the visual motor hierarchy, how vision develops um, subsequent to the motor system, and how uh, once the skills are learned or in place, you're going to be able to um, be able to fixate, what we call fixate, or um, direct your eyes to something, recognize, take action, and uh, react to visual information. So here we have our little our little baby at um, uh, about zero to two months old. And again, there's there, a lot of things are random. Um, as some of the primitive reflexes are expressing themselves, such as the asymmet asymmetric tonic neck reflex, you can see as the infant stretches in one direction, the head and the eyes turn. These are very, very important movements that the child and the infant are making. This is allowing them to learn more about what's called the ambient, the peripheral, or the dorsal stream, you know, the where is it information that's going to develop later. Um, when, the, when some of these movements are not controlled or some of these primitive re reflexes do not express themselves or, or, or later on do not become inhibited, um, it's very difficult to, for, the, for that visual system to develop normally, especially in, in, in binocularity. Um, by, by four months, you have a little bit more intentional looking. Again, that macula hasn't quite matured yet, but um, the infant will turn his head and shift, his, uh, shift the attention of um, anything that's um, uh, brought to the stimulus, so such, as a, such as a toy, mom's face, um, the mobile that's hanging above his crib. Um, and he practices those, those particular movements. Um, at 20 weeks, you should be seeing uh, more, um, uh, more controlled fixations or movements. There should be more movement of crossing midline and some, um, some bringing forth of objects closer in order to start um, um, setting up the stage for what we call um, uh, accommodation or central focus. At uh, 24 weeks, we've got a little bit better hand-eye coordination. That macular fovea matures, and um, the infant is now using more vision to guide motor than motor to guide vision. Um, they're still putting things in the mouth. They're still putting their toes in their mouth, their hands in their mouth. But it's you know they they kind of look at those things um, before they put them in the mouth. Before it was all motor driven and then the vision would kind of kick in and see what that was. Um, we've got continued development from seven to nine months. Um, now we're having a little bit of, um, of coordination between the auditory system and vision. So vision, uh, vi the, uh, the visual system will direct towards an, uh, uh, an auditory stimulus. We've got some creeping and crawling happening now. And as that infant begins to, to rock and to creep, what happens is they're starting to um, develop uh, near far focus. Um, usually what you'll typically see is you'll see the, the, head, the, head's child, uh, the, the child's head go down, his, his tush or his butt comes up, and then he'll pivot the other way where the head comes up and the butt and, and the tush goes down. And what we're learning and what's happening to the visual system as he's doing these movements is that his visual system is learning how to um, focus cl close and far and so on and so, and so forth. Um, as the child begins to walk, um, whoops, as the child begins to walk and explore the, um, his world or, hers or her world, what's happening is she's beginning to see her visual world from different perspectives. So she might be uh, reaching up to that table, then, then, but maybe she'll crawl under that table. So she's getting, she's learning perspective. So the child that doesn't move, that doesn't creep and crawl, is going to be missing some of these very, very critical stages that set, um, that are setting down 
the foundational skills of vision and visual skills. Um, and again, uh, the baby is becoming more and more skilled at um, directing its body to, um, to an action, in this case maybe chasing, chasing a toy, um, and putting into motion movement, vision, and proprioception. Um, so here we are, the visual motor hierarchy sort of, um, sort of uh, re-explain. We have our primitive, um, primitive reflexes, many of which should be um, um, integrated by age two. Um, we have motor or manual exploration of our world. That's the very young infant. Everything is, is sort of randomly, those, those seemingly random movements that the, the infant is making, a lot of kicking with the legs. Um, the motor starts to, as the, the infant bumps into something and touches it, and then they'll turn towards it, so the motor is leading vision. And uh, as they continue to mature, motor and vision become, equ become equalized. And then as the child does mature, vision will now lead directed movement or motion. Um, so fixation is the where is it system, OK? So we get input from our peripheral vision system. And what that does is, in, in the think of primitive man, our, our peripheral system there is sort of our first alert. So our peripheral visual skill, uh, our peripheral um, vision is, um, is represented in the, in, the, in the brain by different types of cells which fire when um, certain kinds of visual um, stimulation uh, is um, is uh, noted, and one of the one of those things would be movement in certain directions, and so it alerts the the organism or the or the brain or the body that something is out there, and it tells us we need to look in that direction. We need to look there, and that's where we put our focal or central vision. And this, when the central vision locks on, that we call fixation. Um, recognition happens when we fixate on the object, we identify the object, and then we make it clear, and then we decide, is this, is this something to be worried about, like on the right, or is this something to go, oh, isn't that cute, on the left? So, so it's our early warning system is the peripheral system, our central system is the one that allows us to, to make sense or determine what the information is. Um, and so one of the things, and, and this is what I stress uh, to my patients, and many behavioral optometrists do as well, is that, that, um, that, the, that our, our first few years of life are very, very critical in um, forming good visual skills and good motor skills. And often I'll counsel my, my uh, young mothers who bring in their children, and we, talk, we sit and we talk about the importance of creeping and crawling, and the importance of tummy time, and the importance of uh, uh, crossing midline, and so on. Because many parents are not getting this information, nor, nor do they know this intuitively. Um, some people think it's really cute to see, to see their child do the, the three-legged um, um, crab crawl or you know or you know they're very proud that their child walks at like eight months which is really much too early because, and what it means is that some of these critical developmental stages are being abbreviated so it's very important especially if we have a, a, a in this audience um, OTs, PTs, um, um, pediatric nurses or pediatricians in this those that kind of information is very very important to to present to the to parents um, and again, the child who doesn't who 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 moves the most will have the most uh, rich uh, experience in building these pathways. Um, when they have very narrow experience or very limited, um, you, know, you know, child's kept in a in a in a rock in a, in a car seat a lot. I don't think they're play pens anymore, but you know, if they're put in a play pen and not allowed to move. Or if they're given very limited um, activities that stimulate both vision and motor, they will have 
a much more difficult time later on in life making those uh, making those more sophisticated um, skills um, or, or developing those sophisticated skills. So children learn best through interactive play. And depending on this audience, many of you may not recognize what, what's happening with that little girl on the, on the bottom right. That's called Jax. When I grew up, every kid played Jax. It developed a lot of hand-eye coordination, skill, speed. Um, kids would play this for hours. I, 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 I don't know one kid in my practice that has ever heard of Jax unless I taught them. And now the moms are getting so young that they don't know them either. So many of these simple games that children played 40, 50 years ago and, and, and even longer were very critical to development. And even simple things like finger painting or using you know, Play-Doh and things like that, again, you're building very, very critical skills, including visual skills. And you know, 15, 20 years ago, parents used to come to me and they used to say, well, you know, the, you know, should I get my child a leapfrog or this and that? They don't even ask that anymore. This is what they come in with. I've got two-year-olds coming in with, uh, with iPhones, iPads, things like this. They, uh, parents, well-meaning, of course, they think they're actually getting their kids to learn eye-hand coordination. What they're doing is restricting that information of eye-hand coordination because this is a two-dimensional um, activity. Uh, children do not have to use very sophisticated um, fine motor skills in order to do this. Um, they're um, having somebody work at a fixed distance for, for uh, long periods of time is also not uh, what we'd like to see in a young child. So this new babysitter, as I call it, really should be very, very the experience should be very limited especially in a young child. And I never recommend more than 30 minutes to older children and even less in younger children. I know that many young parents uh, feel compelled or, or just overwhelmed and they're like, here, take the phone or take the iPad. But it's really important that that, that, that type of activity be limit, uh, limited because you're cutting out all the other developmental um, activities that should be happening at this, at this stage. Um, so again, there, there's lots of evidence uh, among uh, amongst uh, um, amongst the medical field, the education field, that um, that computers, and especially at a young age, are not substitutes for experiences. Motor and vision and proprioception are important building blocks to any kind of learning. Um, and in order for the and, and in order for the, the skills to be um, um, developed, they actually are the building blocks of more abstract thinking that, that comes later on in, in a child's um, in a child's um, academic experience. Okay, so a lot of us in, in behavioral optometry believe in sort of whole brain learning, learning that all learning takes place in the brain. Vision is, is linked to the body and to the mind, as, and as you recall the, the, um, the graphic of how much of the brain is involved in vision and in visual processing, you can get a better, a better uh, appreciation for how much vision really is involved in learning. And of course, neuroplasticity allows for enhancement, and that is the basis of why we think that um, visual, visual therapy or visual rehab um, is an important part of treatment, whether the child is young or um, my patient is, is, is old. I have many elderly patients that come in that have had strokes. I have uh, young, uh, young adults um, and older adults who have had uh, traumatic brain, brain injuries. And again, that, that neuroplasticity is what allows for new learning. So um, um, we shouldn't discount the fact that our IDL ND population also has that ability for, for neuroplasticity, even if there were um, gaps in, in development. So um, a comprehensive vision exam. And again, um, what, what we look for in, um, in, in 
any visions exam is a, is a thorough patient history, including general health and developmental history. And developmental history for me is very, very important. I ask a lot about a pre, pre and postnatal conditions, whether the whether um, um, baby was under stress, was, whether mom was under stress, whether they were whether the baby was delivered by cesarean, uh, whether um, he or she was a preemie. <coughs> um, all these things are important to behavioral optometrists. <coughs> And I'll, and I'll, excuse me, and allow us, excuse me, and allow us to kind of maybe sometimes pinpoint where the disconnect in development might happen. Now, of course, in the in the ID population and the DD population, many of these um, children ha have um, debilitating um, medical conditions, whether they had early heart surgery, in the case of many Down. Um, patients with Down syndrome, um, or if they had, um, or if they were in the NICU, or anything like that, that that would flag a reason why motor development was delayed, and therefore visual development might have been delayed. Um, the next thing we want to know about is just how clearly a patient can see. This again is sight, not vision, and whether they're a uh, able to see 20-20 in each eye, whether one eye is less than the other. Um, we're looking for what we call the presence of refractive errors, or refractive errors like nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, um, and, and most importantly, the assessment of how the eyes work together as a team. Um, can, they, can they focus equally? Can they point their eyes at the same place at the same time, I team me? Um, and, uh, can they have smooth and ballistic eye movements? And of course, the examination, overall examination of the ha eye health. And, then, and then again, in the ID, ND, LD, uh, population, there could be many other um, uh, medical conditions which might um, interfere with how sharply vision is, or, or how sharply sight is developed. So the other things I want to know about is I want to know about the, the activities of daily living. Does the patient work? Uh, again, in this population now, um, many, many more of them will work in some kind of capacity. Do they have other hobbies? This little girl here, um, um, I forgot exactly what her syndrome was, but um, you know, she was a, a lovely little violinist. So I mean, we need to know um, what their goals are and what their life is. Uh, are they literate? Can they read and write? Do they work? Do they shave? Do they ride a bus? Um, therefore, does that mean that they understand how to get to a bus station, how to, how to interpret the signs, how to read them, and so on and so forth? Um, do they have to sort? Do they watch TV? Do they use computers? And they have any sports and hobbies? So all these are part of a behavioral optometric um, intake. And so some particular syndromes have a high prevalence of ocular problems, and that would be Down syndrome, uh, CP, fragile X, and autism. Um, and some of the very uh, common things that we might see that they'll have high refractive conditions, uh, that might mean a lot of farsightedness, nearsightedness, astigmatism, much more than the, um, than the average population. A strabismus, or um, um, what's called the turning eye, um, and a strabismus can be it's an eye turned in, an eye turned out, up, down, obliquely. Amblyopia, again, is the term that we use when the eye is not correctable by standard means to 2020. Do they have any gaze limitations, which might, um, uh, which might point to some kind of nerve palsy? Do they have nystagmus, uh, which, again, uh, further degrades um, uh, clarity of the sight? Any, any optic nerve problems, such as colobomas or uh, any kind of atrophies? Um, do they have any accommodative or focusing problems? And again, any ocular, uh, ocular motor uh, dysfunctions. So um, many of you will see these problems. I mean, they're, they're obvious. If you look at each one of these pictures, um, you can see that the boy on the top, he clearly has a um, um, his right eye is clearly turning out. If you look at the little baby to the left, you can see that her eyes are turning inward. And if you look at, um, that's one of my patients down on the bottom, 
um, you can see that she has an extreme head tilt because she did have some kind of nerve palsy and she also had what's called a atosis where her lid did not um, work normally. Um, so um, she had all this going on in addition to, in, in addition to autism. So um, when we're looking, um, and, and again, many of you may be doing these tests as a screening, um, you want to be um, looking for possible ocular motor or nerve palsy problems. One of the first things I'll do, especially in a nonverbal patient, whether it's an infant or an adult, uh, is just take out something interesting and see if they'll fix some follow on it. So if you look at the little baby, she's, um, he's looking at a little flashy like um, um, target that I'm presenting in front of him. Um, and then one of the other things is we're looking for those for those head tilts. So, oops, I wanted to go back to that to to Margot here. And you can see she presents with a very very specific head tilt. And if you look at this little boy here on on the left, who also has a head tilt, very often these ch children may be uh, sent out immediately for physical therapy because it's the, they thought that they're um, that they have torticollis. And a few few of these children, after having a lots of PT and having you know uh, no improvement, were found to have some kind of um, uh, nerve palsy, which um, prevented them from turning their eyes uh, in, in full range so that they would develop a head turn in order to compensate for that. Um, in autism, again, we have a high percentage that have strabismus, a turning eye, um, almost a third or, or a quarter with uh, some kind of significant refractive error, nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism. 7% uh, with anisometropia, meaning they have fairly high unequal prescriptions, and about uh, a little over 10% with, um, with the amblyopia. They make poor eye contact. That's often why they're referred to, um, to an optometrist, and they have very, very poor fixation and following skills. So again, um, somebody who's intervening in, um, at the pediatrician's office or at the school, you might pick up these things, maybe not know what they mean, but all of a sudden you you know, uh, if you're astute enough, you can say, okay, there's something going on here that's, that is going to impact the way this child uh, will be able to function and learn. And again, they have very poor integration between central and peripheral visual inputs. It's almost as if they cannot sort the noise, the visual noise. So a lot of them will have a lot of avoidance types of behavior. Um, again, cause of uh, visual skill problems, inadequate sensory motor development, like we talked about, trauma, uh, whether it's a birth injury, traumatic brain injury, whether it's seizures, whether it's close head trauma, um, uh, stress will, um, will complicate a visual skills problem, and any kind of contributing factors such as, uh, such as strabismus, amblyopia, or, or an uncorrected visual uh, um, sight problem. Um, again, because um, I see a lot of TBI um, patients um, and TBI patients, especially depending on what's the age of the TBI, um, that the child has a TBI can severely impact their, um, their maturation both, um, um, both visually and, um, and um, developmentally. Um, and you can see that this is a Fairly significant problem. We're all kind of aware of TBIs now, um, but you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, we weren't. And unfortunately, I still have um, I still have a lot of uh, patients that come and tell me that the the neurologist told them they were faking it, which is pretty sad. Um, common visual complaints in a TBI would be photophobia or light sensitivity, blurring, nystagmus, where you have uncontrolled. Um, usually pendular movement, it could be circular movement. Um, do they have difficulty readings? They have problems with spatial skills, balance issues, and diplopia or double vision. Um, so getting back to um, getting an eye exam and whether we should we should intervene. Um, you know, so some some patients, some parents will actually say, you know, well, what's the difference? My my child, did, you know. They're not, they're not capable of learning. They're you know they're in special ed or they're really low functioning. So what difference is it? Um, by not allowing the child or 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 the young adult or the individual to have the best 
um, visual input, what you're doing is you're, you're in a way, um, isolating them. Um, it, it is sort of almost like a, a form of social isolation. Um, so this individual had a, a lot more difficulty in doing daily activities, whether it's, uh, whether it's um, school activity, whether it's um, a work activity, whether it's something really basic like, like toileting and, you know, and self-care. Um, so these things are very, very important. That is why early intervention is, is key. Um, again, um, any child that looks like, that appears like they might have um, a problem, or even children that don't appear like they have a problem, it's recommended that every child get an, uh, get an eye exam before the age of one, um, usually by the age of six months, in order to, to rule out any um, uh, early signs of, of difficulties. So eye contact, again, is something very, very important that, that de helps develop social skills. And then, um, and then withholding and withholding care, again, it's, it's, it's a form of, um, uh, of delaying um, a child's motor and, and cognitive development. So um, many of you probably know Temple Grandin, um, who is probably the most famous person with autism on the planet. Um, but she herself um, recognized um, how, um, how visual information was very confusing to herself. And she actually had uh, visual therapy as she got older. And she um, um, recognized how that might be very helpful to many of the autistic children that we see um, because, um, because it allows, um, by learning certain visual skills and honing those visual skills, you can learn how to filter in input, which is very difficult in an autistic, uh, in an autistic individual, so that they make sense of their visual and physical world. So what is visual therapy and visual training? I've been alluding to it the whole time. Um, and what we're doing in vision therapy is, uh, is, you know, sometimes I'll explain it to parents as sort of, you know, um, visual physical therapy. It isn't really, but that's a good way to explain it to parents because every parent knows physical therapy. Um, and what it is, it's, it's a very prescribed um, use of different techniques in order to enhance and improve whatever visual skills are, are poorly developed or are lacking or not well integrated. So we're looking at visual, visual motor, and visual perceptive and cognitive skills when we're, when we're doing any kind of visual therapy. Now some of you, I don't know if some of you are OTs on this, on this call, but um, OTs do a number of these things, especially in the school setting, which is fabulous. Um, what they what they don't do is the is the further use of lenses and prisms, um, which um, only only um, an eye care provider can can do. Um, so what we have what we have uh, poor visual skills, um, and this is being able to to help the visual system and, and the child in aspects of development and learning. And if you look at this little girl, she has on these little Harry Potter glasses, which are called prism lenses. And prisms are one of the tools that we use to affect visual input. So we can use them to augment visual input, or we could use them to actually strain visual input so that the individual has to make, um, has to now learn a new skill in order to, to, to compensate for the the, the new way that visual information is coming in. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with the term binocularity, it's a, it's the ability of the two eyes, the two systems, the two um, the two pathways coming in, each taking a separate image, if you will, of the object, and then having those two images go go back to the visual cortex and become a composite image. Um, and it allows us what uh, allows us to see a single image in some kind of 3D perspective. Um, why, um, what are some of the causes of a binocular problem? Could be amblyopia, where you have different kinds of um, visual input, or, or, or 
clarity, a strabismus, a, a turning eye, poor control, poor fixation. Um, double vision is a is a um, is a symptom of a binocular problem. The brain have, may have learned to suppress um, the image from one eye because it's it's not as sharp or clear or whatever. And just even fatiguing the uh, uh, fatiguing the visual system will then break down um, binocular skills. And this little boy here, he's working on a on, um, on a task where we're working. He he has amblyopia, and we're working on uh, stimulating the eye that has the worst vision. Um, and you can see he's got these glasses on, which filter out the those those red letters. One eye will see the red letters. One eye will not. Um, this is what it can look like with somebody who uh, has poor binocularity. Everything's kind of run together, maybe not even well uh, and, and not clear. Um, so, uh, so often children especially will not report this as a problem. They do not report that you know things look oddly to them or things look swimming around. So very often I'll use some cues to kind of um, um, explain what those, you know, what I'm talking about when I say double or when I say blurry, so that the child understands it. Um, and this is kind of what double vision looks like. Um, and again, very few children, especially, and very few people with intellectual disability, will actually come out and um, and report something like this, um, especially children, because they don't know what's what's normal, what isn't normal. Um, some, some signs and symptoms, um, they may avoid certain tasks, they may cover one eye, uh, they may lose interest or fatigue quickly, um, they may look clumsy when, when they're trying to you know, hit a ball or something like that. Um, we, could have, we could have words moving around like that. And again, you know, some kids will report this. It's kind of interesting. They, 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 they'll things that they'll say things like you know, the words jump and and pop and you know or smush together. You know, kids will often report this, but they don't usually report blur or double vision. Um, again, focusing um, in in a in a school setting, and especially remember we have a lot of visual I information coming in, so people are looking. Um, they have to look far. They have to look close. Um, they may have to do something for an extended period, especially especially now when everybody's looking at the computer screens. Um, so your ability to um, to change your focus and focus flexibility is very important, and um, that might manifest itself as trouble copying from a blackboard, or rubbing their eyes, or having problem um, with comprehension, or holding things too close to them. That's often those are often little symptoms that and signs that that people will pick up on. They don't know what it means, but especially educators or special ed teachers will pick up on these things. Um, and if you can see on the outside, that's what it looks like in the blurry, and then the inside uh, is supposed to be what it looks like when it's sharpened up um, uh, with, with the appropriate uh, lenses. Um, Hand-eye coordination, again, um, we're, these are these are important. These are important skills because they will manifest themselves in, in, in more sophisticated skills, as, such as writing and copying. Okay. So again, in my in my therapy room, we use a lot of uh, movement in order to uh, in order to reinforce um, uh, more specific visual skills. You can see these little boys are doing um, they're doing some kind of tracking or movement with the balls. Um, and this little boy is uh, doing an eye-hand coordination um, task, which is timed, and um, we have uh, tracking and following. I'm kind of speeding up because I, I know it's late. And so um, very often I'm working with uh, different um, uh, um, different professionals. I'm working with OTs, PTs, especially cranial sacral therapists, um, uh, um, special ed teachers. So we're, we're all coordinating so that the child is getting the best 
um, reinforcement of the skills that we want the, that child to learn. Uh, just quickly, I wanted to uh, mention that some of the some of the drugs that are used, um, especially for ADD and ADHD, um, can cause blurriness, such as Ritalin and uh, Concerta. So um, sometimes I have to deal with the fact that the child may be on something, uh, the child or the adult might be on something that's going to even exacerbate their visual problems. Um, Again, um, also also working with um, auditory integration therapists and neurofeedback, and um, uh, lots of times with the with their uh, with their medical manager. Um, so, when you look at your handouts, you'll be seeing some of um, some links to some uh, organizations that um, that are uh, representing a behavioral um, optometrist and. Um, we're just looking to maximize everybody's abilities so that they have the most healthy and productive life that they can. And um, that is the end of our presentation for the evening. I, I hope that that was uh, informative to most of you. That was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Amber. Um, so at this time, if anyone has any questions about the presentation or about the topic, um, you'll have a uh, question box um, if you like to type your questions in there. Um, also, if you look at your chat box, I posted the link to the survey um, at the end of this if you'd like to follow that link and fill it out. That'd be great. If not, tomorrow um, you'll be getting a follow-up email from GoToWebinar that also has the link in it. Um, so. I have one question about when you were talking about nerve uh, nerve palsy. So, mm -hmm. um, person asked if the per if the patients can turn their head up or down as well, or just side to side. It depends on where the nerve pal um, the nerve palsy is. So it's not. So we're not talking about um, um, a mobility issue. We're talking about an ocular um, uh, one of the um, nerve palsies from the the intra going to the intraocular muscles. So if you have, let's say, a sixth nerve palsy and the child can't adduct, uh, abduct, I'm sorry, um, turning, turning that eye outward, what they'll have to do is turn their whole head. And so the, what they do is they somehow uh, learn very quickly. If they adapt a certain head position, then the two eyes could, learn, could look together in that direction even if that one eye can't abduct. Um, if they have a vertical issue, um, like a like a fourth nerve, trochlear nerve, um, they um, um, they also tend to to develop some kind of head tilt, right or left, depending on which um, uh, which uh, side the nervous um, the nervous uh, affected. Um, with that one young lady that I showed with her head turned back, she developed that posture because she had a, she had a, a congenital ptosis. So in straight ahead gaze, her lids were actually um, uh, covering her pupils, so she couldn't see, so she tipped her head way back so that she would be able to see. So when you see a child um, or even an adult later on in life, uh, I just had an elderly woman come in this, this, uh, this morning with a, with a fourth nerve. Um, when somebody starts to adapt an unusual head position, uh, one shouldn't just assume that it might be, um, you know, um, a, a neck issue. One has to actually look at the intraocular uh, muscles and make sure that they're actually uh, have full full range of motion. Right. right. Any other questions? Oh, I think we do. Yeah, we have a comment on your previous question said so that the person had a student who um, would present with a strange neck position and it was because of ocular um, difficulties rather than a neuromuscular problem. Yeah, and, and you know, especially for especially for, for pediatricians and so on, you know, or, or nurses who deal with the pediatric population that um, that's an important thing. And the other thing, I, I don't know how many out there are, are physicians or, or pediatricians or, or work with pediatric. Um, 
one of the most important things <laughs> is your ophthalmoscope. <laughs> and um, many of you, especially medical school, you really learn how to use your ophthalmoscope well. You sort of know how to use it. But your ophthalmoscope could actually be one of the first tools to identify um, anisometropia, and that's a, different, a big difference between the two eyes. So um, uh, if there is a large refractive error difference between the two eyes, especially farsightedness in one eye and not in the other, um, you can actually pick that up with your ophthalmoscope by seeing the difference in how much uh, lens power you have to dial in. Um, I often, you know, will will coach medical students or even <laughs> or even physicians and teach them how to actually use their ophthalmoscopes um, because you're not often taught how to use them properly and they can be a great diagnostic tool uh, and that is a is something to, to, to say hmm there's something going on that's different in each eye absolutely I have many uh, attendings and educators who sing the praises of the ophthalmoscope from cardiologists to pediatricians to um, really, at any clinician, you can find out a lot from a, a lot about uh, you know you can diagnose diabetes, a lot of vascular abnormalities. Yep. So. That's it. You can see the back of the eye. <laughs> sure. But even even as you as you as you focus onto the back of the eye, that'll tell you a lot about the uh, about the visual system and, sure. and whether there's a refractive error. So at this point, if there's no more questions, um, I'd say thank you very much to Dr. Danberg. Uh, I think it's a very important topic, especially for this population. Um, if anyone has any more questions, um, you can feel free to email me. I can direct them towards Dr. Danberg. My email is on the flyer that you used to register. And with that, um, I'll say good night. Night. Thank you all for, for joining us. Great, thank you.